Good evening. <laughs> so glad you're all here. I see some still coming in, but that's okay. How have you been? The past two weeks, we've really laid the foundation for your faith. Do you feel like you have learned some new things? Yes. How many of you find yourself now through the week thinking about a new identity truth? Um, I want you to take just a couple minutes at your table, just go around quickly and start and just give one new identity truth that God has really been reminding you of, okay? And I'm going to make it really quick, so like three minutes, okay? Just go around in your table. Okay, it got quiet, so I'm going to move forward, okay? How many of you, just by a quick show of hands, uh, said blameless? You didn't? I thought for sure you'd find that one. That was one of my favorite ones when I got into uh, really understanding what it meant by being in Christ. Because I was, when I came into SALT, I was one of those people that if anything went wrong, I would just immediately go, I'm sorry. You know, like, what's your name? I'm sorry, did I not get that? You know, it's just I felt like I spent most of my life apologizing for who I was. And uh, I don't know if any of you are like that, but for me, this was revolutionary for me to start to embrace who I really was in Christ. Now, we're not going to, I'm not going to reteach that, guys. So I really uh, want you to spend some time in your workbook. If, if you're just joining us now, jump into your workbook. It's going to teach the, the truths that I'm doing here, but it's, and it's going to help you with questions that you ask yourself that uh, just, before, uh, just between you and God, you don't even have to share them, okay? But I do really want you to start to think, um, about who you are in Christ. Um, it's not enough just to know about Jesus. Can you understand that? In order to live for Jesus, you really need to be in relationship with him. It's not enough to just know his name, okay? Many people do. In fact, many times they say his name in profanity. And yet that hurts his heart when you're in relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and walk in the Holy Spirit. Now, tonight we're going to enter into another dimension, and this will build on the first two lessons. Um, if you remember, we talked about those questions from the beginning, like, who, who am I? Well, we sort of have answered that, haven't we? But what I'm answering that question with for you is not how the world answers who you are. You understand that. There's two different thought patterns here, okay? So, but you're now exploring that question, who am I? You're a child of God. You're holy, you're blameless, you're loved, you're adopted into his kingdom. You have a brand new life ahead of you in Christ. And so you can ask that question all over again is, why am I here? Now you actually should have an answer on why you are here, why your life matters. See, God needs us in the sense that we are the representatives of his kingdom here in a dark world. Your life matters. All lives matter. But your life as a child of God now really matters because that means God has a kingdom purpose for your life. And of course, that what's wrong with the world we're going to explore that tonight. And we're going to see very clearly by the time you leave here tonight how as a Christian, how as a believer living in a dark world, you are going to operate differently. You can't be the same. 
We, have, we are in Christ now, so that means our choices, things we do and we say, now reflect who rules our life. Jesus is sitting on the throne in our heart. Not us. Okay. But now there's going to be some struggle, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, before I do, though, I do want to take a minute and read you uh, something that was very eye-opening to me uh, years ago. And it's a little story about a man named Max Jukes, and he was from New York. Do we have any northerners in this? Okay. Okay. Many years ago, a man named Max Jukes lived in New York. He did not believe in Christ or in Christian training. He fathered 13 children. He refused to take his children to church, even when they asked to go. He has 1,026 descendants. Of these, 300 were sent to prison for an average term of 13 years. 190 were public prostitutes. 509 were admitted alcoholics and drug addicts. His family, thus far, has cost the state in excess of $420,000. Surely, the agnostic influence of their ancestor filtered down through his many descendants who made no contribution to society. Now, on the other hand, Jonathan Edwards lived in the same state at the same time as Jukes. He too fathered 13 children he loved the Lord and saw that his children were in church every Sunday. This beloved preacher also served the Lord to the best of his ability. Edwards had 929 descendants, and of these, 430 were ministers. 86 became university professors. 13 became university presidents. 75 authored books. Seven were elected to the United States Congress, and three were governors. One descendant was vice president of his nation. Jonathan Edwards' descendants never cost the state one cent. This great preacher not only influenced his era for Christ, his Christian beliefs and values filtered down through his many descendants who contributed immeasurably to the life of plenty in this land. You may think your life doesn't matter. You may be quick to tell your children their lives matter. But your life does matter, especially as you parent children, as you influence the people around you, I'm sure many of you right now are thinking about your parent, how you were parented. What I'm going to talk about tonight has a lot to do with what's caught, not taught. You see, people read you. They get an idea just from hanging out with you and spending time with you, who you are and what you love. That's the one thing about Jesus I really wished I'd walked and talked and lived with him. Have you ever thought about what it must have been like being a disciple and traveling with him? You know, I would have loved to have seen his reaction to somebody who um, just rolled their eyes at him. <laughs> you know, I, I just would have loved to see how he responded to that kind of, um, you know, or to if someone ignored him or um, dissed him or just didn't like him. I would have loved to have seen his responses. We can imagine, but I think the disciples that traveled with Jesus, they got to catch so much more than what's written in the Word. And you know, that's what brings the life to the Word. When you start to read it and think about it, and chew it up and, and start to imagine being there. See, too many of us reduce the word 
to paper and ink. And you miss the life part of the word. And that's what I'm talking about. Especially when we're going to learn now about how you and I are made. See, we're all made the same way. In Hebrews, um, I love how God says, only God can separate the soul from the spirit and the spirit from the soul. Only he can. And his word can do it because it's sharper than a two-edged sword. But only he can do it. We still cannot do it. I drew this simple diagram. It's in your, in your uh, books today. But I want you to see that you're a three-part being made in the image of God. You're a spirit who has a soul and lives within a body. You'll hear me many times refer to the body as your earth suit. Um, my children were really young. They were nine and they were uh, four and a half when they had to watch their dad die. He had got cancer. He was just 45. And uh, the best way to explain it to them at that time was really to say this was daddy's earth suit that got a disease. And if we could make it better, we're, gonna, we're just going to pray that God will heal him. But if he doesn't, then we know that daddy will still be alive, but he'll be alive with Christ. We'll be able to go with him. It's hard to really wrap your mind around that. You can only imagine as a child. But I use that simplicity to tell each one of you that death happens to our earth suit because now we are in Christ, right? Okay, any questions on this? See, this is our time to be on this earth. You are born and you have so many years to live. Even God is the only one who knows when your last day is, your last breath. And so that's why this is important to understand about how you are made. This is that part where we're still learning about who am I. Well, now you know that what God says about you is truer than what anybody else will say about you. But you also need to know what it's like to be made in the image of God. And so you're a three-part being. Our foundational verse in this is Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh... Sets, it desi sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. It's almost like we're made with checks and balances now, okay? Because what you're going to do is you're going to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. You are in Christ. You live in him. But you also... live in this world. Okay. And so when you've got this kind of um, tension between the two, between the spirit and the body or flesh, then certain things are happening within your soul. Now it's interesting about the soul. I've said this before. One of uh, a real poignant, you know, you have those aha moments sometimes, and I remember uh, the, the very time that um, the Twin Towers came down, as I'm sure many of you do. And one thing that um, really, besides the whole event, and as I sat there just stunned and, and shocked as I watched the TV and saw what was happening in our world, um, as the days progressed, the count for people went up. And almost unilaterally, through all the news stations, they referred to them as souls. Do you remember that? That meant so much to me, is that they acknowledged that every single one was a soul. And what that means is that they had a mind, they had emotions, and they had an ability to make choices. 
Their day started like every other day. They thought about going to work or going to that area of New York. Some of them maybe, you know, hit the snooze alarm several times, worked on those emotions to get there. Others took various places, but ultimately their chooser, their will, decided to go there that day. The interesting thing about it was the only one not surprised was God. They had appointments with him that day. Okay, he knew. He was already prepared. He had extra angels there escorting souls from this world into his. I never want to forget it. I know that's why God has allowed me. Every time I just even see the word soul, I think of the souls that have gone before us. You may ask, and I hope you do. I actually challenged the, you with this in your email this week. Why doesn't your behavior always reflect your true identity in Christ? Why doesn't your behavior always reflect your identity in Christ? Well, Romans 7, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this. He says, for what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. Interesting. Even the Apostle Paul is realizing, I've got this tension going on inside of me all the time. I want to do something good, and I find myself on the opposite end, messing up. Okay. And that is where we can all meet. We all, there is none righteous. <laughs> no, not one. You know, I love the expression. We used to have a song that we sang here a lot, uh, but it was, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. I love that song because it just levels us all out. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all needed our Savior. He died so that we could live. So understanding how you were designed is going to help you with your new behaviors. <laughs> okay, that's why this is really important. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, another great verse. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Now, this word sanctify, I want to I wanna just camp out just a few minutes here. Um, every Thursday, uh, we have a, a group of moms, young moms that have children and uh, I just love these girls, and we just we learn and, and just open the word together. And one of uh, the, the words that sort of trip us up is the sanctification word. And uh, can anybody define it? That's consecrated. Huh? It's okay. No, it's trouble. I'm going to tell you what it is. <laughs> You're doing good, but it's one of those Bible words. We don't use it too much in our world today. It's sanctified. And so I'm going to, huh? In a sense, but let me explain it this way. And you're all going to, you're going to find, it's going to be easy now. You're going to understand sanctification, okay? We're going to buy a new house, okay? And it's freshly built. It's got all brand new appliances. Your family, uh, you, you, a couple, three kids, all under five, they're getting their first home and they walk into this new home and they've got all brand new appliances. Everything is squeaky clean. It just looks awesome. It is home. Okay. Fast forward three months in the new house. 
What do you think it looks like? <laughs> you get it. Okay. If it is not cleaned every day, if the floors aren't mopped every day, if mom is not following all three of those little ones around every single day, if the vacuum's not going every single day, what is that house going to look like? Lived in, right, lived in. <laughs> it's not a pig pen yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's only been three months, but you get it. See, unless that level of new is maintained, it's not going to look good as time goes on. And that's the <coughs> sanctification process for your house. You have to cooperate with God to keep that house looking new, don't you? You've got to you know, be intentional about repairs. You've got to be intentional about cleaning. Um, that's why, you know, you've heard our, our spring cleaning, spring is coming, got to pull all, all, everything out and get everything cleaned. And this is what sanctification in our lives can, you can relate to. Because I've just spent the past two weeks telling you, you're in Christ, you're a brand new creature, old things are gone, the new has come. We're in Christ now, we, have, we are blameless, we're holy, we're chosen. But if we don't continue to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, you're going to lag behind. You are. You're going to start to, you know, little piles of stuff here, little piles of stuff there, uh, overflowing trash in other areas, unmade places, mold, mildew, <laughs> we live in the, at the shore. Okay, you get my point. So, if you aren't diligent to walk in step with the Spirit, then this whole new way of life is going to stop or it's, you're just going to camp out, you're going to get lazy in it. So now I've just mentioned something that's walking in step with the Spirit. Now, not everybody is walking in the same gait. Little kids don't walk in the same amount of steps as mom and dad do, okay? But what I mean by the Holy Spirit, the walk of the Spirit, is he's very specific on things. He will tell you if you are still, ever heard that verse? Be still and know that I am God. Okay. When you are still and you make time for him, he will always lead, guide, and direct you. He will. If you're not hearing from him, it's you. It's not him. He's always speaking. He wants you to get in step with his spirit. And, that, and what we're going to learn right here is exactly why. We need to be aware of God. You know, you have the, um, just the incredible gift from God to grow and have your families and be by the ocean. And I often marveled at God's goodness when he brought me back I, I grew up, actually, um, on an island in New Jersey, um, a barrier island in New Jersey, and I loved the ocean. And uh, then we lived in the mountains for a while, but then when my husband got sick and I couldn't take care of my children and him at the same time, we moved down here uh, because my parents had retired here. And I thought, this is just what a gift it was to be able to go to the beach and really be still and hear from God. You can only imagine it was a very hard time for our little family. But I remember one day, just it was a beautiful, one of those beautiful days that um, where the, the ocean didn't hardly look like it was even had a wave in it, you know, but you could still hear the noise of the ocean. It's so big. And I was thinking about that. I go, wow. I don't really hear anything but the little laps of the, of the tide. 
and yet I could hear that body of water moving. And I thought, God, how so like you to be the biggest entity in this world and you still are moving and wanting to talk to me. And I got great comfort from that in knowing that God was so big and I was so small and yet he cared. I knew he did. He was taking care of me and the children and my husband. You see, when you connect in your awareness of God, then what he does is he really helps you through everything else you experience in this world to find peace. See, your soul, like I said, is your mind. Before he could do anything in my life, he had to quiet my mind. My mind was doing rabbit trails all over the place. What if he dies? What if, what if we can't manage this? What if, we're, what if we're really, I was very worried about our finances. Our, our savings at the time was just like waters just flowing out. Um, my husband uh, was always self-employed, so he didn't have life insurance, and so all of everything, we were, everything was just falling apart in my world. Um, but the amazing thing about it was I would go out there and my mind would find peace. I'd run there and I'd, I'd walk three miles every morning and by the time I, I just got tired enough to be still and quiet, God would give me um, verses that I had hidden in my heart. I knew that he was gonna carry me even if, I got, if it got too hard. He would amazingly tell me, he said, I'll make roadways in a wilderness and streams in a desert. I'm still that God. I can make a way for you. And I would come away from there refreshed for that day. And interestingly enough, you know, I'd go pick up my kids at school, and by the time, take care of my husband during the day, and by the time I got ready for bed that night, I'd be all out. <laughs> And I'd have to get up and do it all over again the next day. Because that's what he promises us. Peace for the day. Hope for tomorrow. Do you see? And so as we look at this, we have to see that however we are thinking in here, how we are feeling in here, your emotions. Oh my goodness, my emotions were a roller coaster. You can only imagine. And they were leading in all of our choices, um, I'm so grateful that my husband believed in God. That brought immeasurable peace through this. But what's going to happen in this tension in your life is this is going to affect your beliefs and behaviors. This is why. You had to get it straight in your head to have the mind of Christ. Do you see? You can't have the mind of who you are. I couldn't have the mind of Linda anymore. I had to depend on the mind of Christ. You see? We get input from the world all the time. And so in this world that we live in, it's through our senses, our sight, our hearing, our tasting, our smelling, our touching, everything. You know, I have a, a little grandbaby and everything that he experiences in life goes through the taste test or the, the tactile test. And this is everything that he relates to the world with are through his senses, okay? But we are the same way. We just, that's how we started out and, and how, um, how we grow and mature. So, in this world, we are heavily influenced by family and friends, right? Okay, what other things are we influenced by? Job. Job. 
maybe your title, whatever that may be. Media. 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 How about your location? Just the fact that we live here or our leisure. Hobbies. Money, finances, education. ah, education. Even stuff. Okay. I want you to see, look at all of this clamoring for your mind, for your emotions, and it's influencing how you're making choices all the time, all the time. That's what we live under. That's our awareness of the world. Who is the greatest influencer in the world? I wish I could agree with that. Satan. Satan. Yeah, he was given dominion. Remember when he fell from heaven and God's grace, he was given dominion over the earth and he does heavily influence the world he is god's enemy you have to be aware of that satan he actively influences the world you know when isis and all the middle east conflicts started to really come up i had to ask myself this question is this has this always been going on? Has it gotten worse? Or is it just the fact that we hear about it more? And see, I'm more inclined to think barbarism, diabolical maniacs have always been there. And now we are just inundated with media, social media, and the interesting thing about it is it puts fear in you. The very one thing that if you walk and dwell in fear, that is the total opposite of faith. Fear and faith cannot occupy the same space any more than oil and water. And it's really intimidation tactics yes it's a real enemy that's why god raises up soldiers but it's amazing how even the little state of israel that country of israel has amazing stories of how they have been able to hold off the evil all these years it's amazing Nothing short of a miracle. They should have been under a long time ago. We know who's fighting their battles, don't we? Yes, when God is for you, who can be against you? They have to live in that all the time, but they are looking to God. Ephesians 2.2 says, You used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of power of the air. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. You have to know who your enemy is. What I'm hopefully doing for you is I'm taking your eyes off of your circumstances right now, off of this in this world, and I'm trying to get you to focus on the bigger piece here, which is there is another battle going on, and it's good and evil. Okay. How do you fight evil? The Bible says you fight it by doing good. You can't believe anything but God. See, he says, greater is he that's in you than anything that's in this world. 
That's why it's important for you to know you're in Christ. So greater is he in you than anything that this world has to come against you. Now, I don't say that lightly. Those of you that have been here for the first and second weeks, then you know. I had a child who was murdered. Two teenagers who should have been at the parole hearing <laughs> killed my child. I could live like a victim and all you wonderful, loving church people would just help me. But I'm not going to live like a victim. I'm going to live like an overcomer. See, what God, or what the, Satan intended for evil, God intended for good. Whatever you're dealing with in your life right now, you have to shift your posture. I, I, if you're going to live like a victim, you will be a victim. You will. A lot of people, they feel better if they can help a victim. <laughs> it makes them feel good. <laughs> I didn't get a whole lot of help in the Christian community other than the fact that they would cry with me and wail with me, but no one was telling me what I'm telling you right now. That's why I'm going to say it. Yes, there's a measure of grieving and time, and I took mine, I took my good old time being on the pity pot. I did. But I got to a point where I got really tired of feeling sorry for myself. Nothing could change my past. Remember, we talked about this. When you're in Christ, now you have a new past. You see, everything is brand new, including your past. Which means, yes, I don't want a lobotomy. I always want to remember that I had a precious little boy who died in a horrible way. But what I want to remember is that God allowed that to come into my life because he knew he could trust me with it. I know who my enemy is. Do you? See, my enemies are not those two boys that killed my son. No, it was bigger than that. See, Satan wanted to steal what Bill and Linda had in him. I'm not going to let that happen. And you shouldn't let that happen either. If it's in your life right now, then God has a reason, and he will give you the strength and the power and the knowledge in him to be an overcomer. Um, he's, I don't see him here tonight, but we have a really neat guy named Eric who, who comes to this church. In fact, you see him often in, on the stage because he's moving props all the time. And I don't know whether you've noticed, but he only has one arm. He's got just a stub on the other. And every time I see him moving things and doing things, he just inspires me. I think, you know, who better to be moving things around than, than Eric? You know, a lot of us, we don't use the two good arms we have as much as he uses his one. Do you see what I'm saying? There is just something in that that speaks of the power of God. Do you see? That's why we can say we're changed lives, changing lives. See, what comes right before that, though, is are you captivated by Christ? He's got that power that lives in you and lives in me, and he wants you to be fully accessing that. Instead, we go back to that first uh, diagram that I grew, where most of us still want to play God in our lives. We don't like being co-pilot. It's uncomfortable. We don't like it not knowing where we're heading. Yet God knows, and he's, he's not out to get you. He's out to give you 
an abundant life. We all want our own way, or we want everything for ourselves, or we want to appear important. Well, you know what? He knows your heart, but he can't let you have any of that unless he knows you belong totally sold out for him. There's something made in you that wants to be like God. And that's what we're talking about here tonight. It's the flesh. You want to be controlling, judging, seeking praise. And so through the rest of the salt, we're going to be talking, we'll refer to it many times as the flesh. And when you choose to follow your flesh, your beliefs and behaviors will start to go south too. Fear, doubt, you're going to be off the path. You know, I hate to burst your bubble, but, you know, you, just coming to church is not going to give this to you. If it did, we'd have a lot more people sold out and walking God's way, but it's not. Now, that may work in the sense where it's building discipline in you. Maybe you're not good at getting to where you need to go on time and go places. So I don't want to, but that's just God getting you, dis, you know, embracing discipline and, and, and doing those things. If he can't trust you with the little things, how will he ever trust you with the big ones? And for some of you, it's just getting up and going to church. And I applaud that. That's good. That's a good start. It's a good start. I don't want to defeat you in that. But there's so much more to the life of a believer. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 says, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activities, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. This, believe it or not, comes naturally. That story that I read you in the beginning about Jukes, he didn't try. And look at what happened. That's what happens when you don't try and you don't even make an effort. You're just going to go off in the weeds. There's absolutely nothing good about the flesh. The flesh wants its own way and it's always looking for fulfillment and never satisfied. It's greedy and proud. Therefore, the influences of the world catch the attention. I'm amazed at what media, I'm so glad, I think this is the first class I've had that actually as we did this, uh, mentioned media right away. Usually I have to add it. But it's such a part of our culture now that media influences us so much. And yet if I stand there with my Bible and start to read the Bible, you're going to just turn me off. It's just not as exciting. Sad. The message from our world is pretty grave right now. Possessions make you happy. Um, the more money you have, you're succeeding. Um, if it's up, if it is to be, it's up to me. Like you can do it in your own power. There are so many lies that we are bombarded with all the time. So where do you start? We're going to take a little bit of table time right now. What input from the world is affecting your beliefs and behaviors? Let me say that again. What input from the world is affecting your beliefs 
and behaviors. Let's take some time at your tables. This is a, one of those heavy questions. You gotta really start to think about your life. Okay, I wanna just pull you back in for a minute and then we're gonna take a break. But I wanna make it clear that the flesh, the flesh that we relate to the world with is the part of you that can be enticed to sin and rebel against God. We all have it. So in order to not be enticed, you answer that question. See, when you choose to follow your flesh, your beliefs and behaviors <coughs> will be influenced by the world because they're not being influenced by God. Do you see? So there has to be a determination within your character, within your being, of who you're going to serve. Are you going to be a slave to your flesh? Or are you going to be a slave to the spirit? I know when I went through uh, my training, my trainer, he would always say, which dog in the fight are you going to feed? <laughs> and you know, it's true. Which one are you going to feed? Because you know what? None of you is a puppet. You all have a free will. It's up to you to make right choices. But the wonderful thing is God is in you now. You are in Christ. You have all the power you need to overcome evil. It's living and dwelling in you. You just have to learn to access that, access it through the Holy Spirit. That's why you're in this class. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, the whole next four weeks, well, we have one more week in this book, but then the next four weeks is a psychological teaching. And it's going to really help you understand where your mind is and how you're thinking and where it came from and how to get into a different place. But for right now, you need to just know there's absolutely not one good thing about the flesh. The, the flesh wants its own way all the time. It's always looking for, familiar, uh, for fulfillment, but it's never satisfied. What lies are you listening to? What journey are you on that you know is not what God wants you to be doing? These are things that you have to be willing to ask God and let him answer. You know what, we showed the, the transformer last week. I'm not gonna undo it right now. The old man is inside here and I want you to go on the journey with me and let him drive. That means a lot more right choices than wrong choices. Okay, and we'll talk more about that. Go get your snack and we'll come back in about 15 minutes. Ezekiel 36, 27. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will obey my laws and do whatever I command. This is why you are an extension of God. We are in him now. You are not your own. In Romans 7, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will, flee, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. No matter what you do, if you remember... Um, the diagram from last week, I showed you how God picks you up out of that miry clay, sets your feet in Jesus. You are with Jesus in Christ. Will you sin again? Yes. He is the God of 2,000, 3,000 chances, guys. But let's not cheapen his grace. He does that because he loves you and he covers you with his grace. He knows you're in process. It's the same type of thing we do to our children. We love our children, but they mess up, don't they? 
We have to allow them to fail. We have to allow them to make their mistakes. We can't fix it for them, but we can trust in the God who can. And see, this is what Jesus does when he trusts the will of his Father, his Heavenly Father with us. He did the part, though, to attach us, to dwell in us through the Holy Spirit. It's important that you receive input, input from God when you are in Christ. See, because God's Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he's speaking to you. You can make decisions based on what he says instead of what the world says. In the next, uh, the psychological book, we, we will be talking about how God wants us to have eyes that see into the unseen, ears that hear in a supernatural way. I'm not making any of this up, guys. This is what you get when you become in Christ. You are not just a cartoon, a flat person in this world with ink and pen. You are a spirit being. Your spirit has an awareness of God. If you are new in Christ, you, this has to grow. It has to, uh, God will continue to grow you in this way. It's amazing how we don't have to tell our body to grow, right? You don't stay up at night going, grow, grow. Okay. We, uh, you know, we, this is built into us. You will worry a lot more if something is not growing. It's the same way with healing. We make such a big deal out of healing, and yet it's as natural and as supernatural to God as it can be. He's already built healing into you. You get a cut, what happens in about a month? You can't even see where it was. It's in you. Now, yes, he uses doctors and he uses medicine, but do not fool yourself. God is the one behind that. He's the one using their hands. He's the one using the medicine. He does not fear anything that we fear. You know, when, I, um, when my husband was diagnosed with cancer, you know, my world fell apart again. I'll be honest with you. Um, it was 10 years after Will had been uh, murdered, and then my 45-year-old husband, who's never been sick a day in his life, gets diagnosed with um, diffuse large cell lymphoma. Okay, and it's rushing into the fourth stage. We knew what to do. We knew to call the elders and ask them to pray over us. We did that. We knew that if we um, maybe did some alternative uh, therapies instead of chemo right away, that maybe God would use and work through that. And we poked and we prayed for that. But ultimately, God's plan was that in less than a year, actually, which was great, because with his diagnosis, he should have only been given, he was actually given six weeks to live and we actually had um, a scant year. We had 11 months with him. And I know that God, that was God's mercy and his grace for my children, um, his mercy and grace for me. I look back on that time and I know that I got blessed with the opportunity to be with the love of my life and say everything he <coughs> needed to say before he went to God. A lot of people that lose loved ones don't have that. I know I can't even begin to tell you what I would have done if I had just known that Will wouldn't be waking up the next morning. But I got that. God gave that back to me with Bill because we were able to say everything. He was able to go into the hands of God with everything said and done. What a gift. Okay. God does not fear death. We shouldn't fear death either. Can you see this? 
See, God is a spirit being. He's not bound by this earth suit. We are. And only in one aspect. Our spirit, our, our mind, our will, and our emotions, and our spirit live on. It's important for you to get this in your head and start to let this um, color or help you to have that mind of Christ. This is how God is thinking for you. Ezekiel 36, 27, and I will put my spirit in you so you will obey my laws and do whatever I command. That's a command, so you will do them. Really, for a Christian, if you believe in Jesus and you are in Christ, this is not an option. <laughs> this is not an option. This is what you get to do. And if you do not grow in the spirit and continue to walk with God, you choose not to. God wants you to grow with him. He wants you to, to grow in the magnitude of who he is. He says, the same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe he will supply every need that you have? Yes. Some of you may be scared because it doesn't say every want. Uh -huh. I'm saying that's fear. And that's a big influence from the world. It's different. From the Lord your God has a, arrived to live among you. He is mighty Savior. He will rejoice over you with great gladness. And with his love, he will calm your fears. See, this fear thing has much too big a hold on Christians. If you remember when I was talking to you about the enemy... He has a persona. It's very selfish, very self-centered. I think it's ironic that we live in a culture where selfies is part of our vernacular now. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. Self-centric. Everything's around self. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's a distorter of truth. He's an accuser. Why are you listening and engaging with the, with the vernacular that he puts out to us? If you are watching media, if you are caught up in media, are you really thinking with the mind of Christ? Are you really examining some of the things that are sent your way? I hope you are. If you allow the input from the world to define what you believe and how you behave, you'll believe lies and you're going to behave badly. And this is called walking after the flesh. In a lot of ways, what it does with your beliefs and behaviors, do you remember in the playground when you were little, there was this thing called a teeter-totter? Okay? And depending on who was bigger, that would go down, wouldn't it? And if it was a little person on this side, that would go up, okay? And so what you really are involved in with your choices, making right choices, is what side are you uh, feeding? Good or evil? It's important that we get balanced, that we see God, see with God's eyes, the world. In and of itself, guys, this is just our world. It's, I'm not saying it's bad. There is bad involved in it, though. Every good has an evil side to it. We'll talk about that more later, too. It creates a battle in your soul and they compete for your attention. Who's getting more attention, your flesh or spirit? In Galatians 5, 16 and 17, it's a great verse here, he says, so I advise you to live according to your new life in the Holy Spirit, 
Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature or the flesh craves. The old sinful nature or the flesh loves to do evil, which is just opposite from what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, and your choices are never free from this conflict. You always have a choice. Doing nothing is a choice. But you always have one. One of my favorite verses when I was going through um, the death of my husband was uh, a verse that is used in this chapter. Because I was, every day, I would wake up in the beginning and I would wonder, is this the day he dies? I didn't know. And that was fear. And I realized, I was, I said, this is just killing me. I'm waking up with fear the whole day then I'd wonder, you know, is this his last breath? And he went through some really hard, a lot of pain in, in his cancer. And, and so I found I was always waiting for him to die. And I just cried out to the Lord. And, and the verse that he, um, that he gave me was one that uh, Paul wrote. Um, says these light and momentary trials are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And you know, when I embraced that verse and I started to look up where he wrote it and just a little bit more about it, I thought, gee, you know, that's really good for you, Paul, but you know, what were you really doing then? I don't know, I, I, I wanna know. And you know what he was doing when he wrote those words? He was serving time in a jail in a rat-infested jail. And here I was at the beach, in Myrtle Beach, with my parents. I had prayed for years that I'd live closer to my parents. And here I was, wasn't ideal, the situation. But God was working in ways that I wasn't seeing because I was only looking through my misery lens my fear lens, instead of the life lens that God has for all of us. That lens that Paul put on when he said these light and momentary troubles are achieving for me an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Wow. What's in your life right now that seems bigger than that? He challenged me that day. And I determined that from then on, I was going to wake up in the morning and I was going to say, okay, Lord, how can we make this the best day we've had? You just live it like it's your last. And you know what? We learned to have fun. Bill was popping wheelies in a wheelchair. He was paralyzed on one side with, with Benjamin, was just a little guy, and he'd put him on his lap and pop wheelies on the speed bumps. <laughs> you know, you do it as to get done. And we'd pack up in the, in the van, and we'd go up to Broadway at the beach and just get him out in the air. And we just learned to to make the best day ever with our family each day. Yeah. These light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You see, if Satan can get you thinking about your life and all the misery you have in it, he's winning, guys. I hate to tell you that, but you've, you've already advocated to the enemy. You're feeding the wrong dog. And so it's up to you to make the choices on what you are going to feed, the right one.
What this requires is taking thoughts captive. You have to get those miserable old patterns out of your head. And you know how you do that? I wish I could plug you up to a machine and let it all erase, but it doesn't do it. <laughs> That's what I wanted. <laughs> I thought it was much too laborious to do it the way I was doing. But what it is, is it's one thought at a time. God will start to do this. He just wants you to partner with him. You know, it's interesting. I um, recently had uh, someone in my life tell me, you know, I was working on this, and what I realized was that other things were leaving my life, not just the process, that things I didn't even think of were dropping away from my life. And see, that's the way, that's God's goodness. That's his greatness, his bigness. If you start to eliminate just one thing in your life, you're going to realize that more things fall away than you ever realized. Just by making one change, maybe, in your, in your life, it brings more. And God does that to encourage us. He says, stay the course. Keep walking. Tonight, your leaders are giving you a couple handouts, and I want to go over them before we um, dismiss. One of them is um, an incredible couple of scriptures. And in the, um, in, the, uh, in the Bible, they're both in the New Testament, both penned by the Apostle Paul. And he talks about putting off and putting on. And um, what's fun about this is that um, I always think it's amazing I know the sermon yesterday was on Philippians 2, where Jesus, of course, had taken off all the glory of heaven and God and came to earth, never considering equality with God something that he would even get here. Okay, He knew it was forever changed. He was coming down on mission from his Father. And it's interesting because this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is trying to get us to understand is that very thing that we share in Christ is done this way, and it's called putting off and putting on. And the scriptures, uh, Ephesians 4.32, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Now that's the put off. We're going to put off the old, the old man inside of us. Okay, now how do we do that? And I want you to follow with me the words that are penned in the um, Message Bible. Now, I don't know about you. I love the Message uh, Bible. And, and let me just tell you a little bit about it. Um, this is not a translation. Okay, it's a paraphrase. And why I love it is because they've taken from the translation but it's in street language, okay? It's in street language, which means it's probably the language that Jesus uh, rubbed shoulders with all the time. I mean, the fishermen were not educated. Paul was, but the fishermen, the, most of the disciples weren't. When they gathered in the, um, to meet and felt fellowship and all, they spoke street language. They didn't speak. Uh, all real proper English. In fact, when the disciples were brought before the Sanhedrin, they said, these guys aren't even learned guys. <laughs> they're, simple. they're simple guys. And so what I, what I love about the message is that it talks to you in plain speak. Okay, it means like if you were talking with your buddies. And I want to, now I just read you that verse out of, um, I think it might be King James, I'm not sure, but what I want to read you is what it says in the message, and I think you're going to even understand it better, okay? So listen to me carefully. Um, he says, That's, uh, you learned Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have uh, as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance, everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty clear. Uh, 
In here it says, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. But I love how he says here, he says, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Isn't that great? You know? I love um, to read verses that expound like that because that hits me where I'm at. Sometimes we get uh, full of the, the Christianese or, or even the old way of speaking, and we don't speak like that now. But you know what? The message is still the same. We've got to stop it. See, we don't have to act like that. He said, get rid of it and take on the entirely new way of life. What are you afraid of? What are you afraid your family's going to say? What are you afraid your boss is going to say? You shouldn't be afraid. Just do it. I'd be more worried about what God thinks about me. Do you see? He's going to encourage you and build you up. That's why we hang out here on Monday nights. Guys, you could be home watching... Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's on TV on Monday nights. I don't know. Is this the bachelor night? Maybe it is. Okay. So some of you have really sacrificed your Monday nights. I'm very grateful. Okay. And then I want you to see the second side of this. That's what we take off. Now we're going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And that's in Romans 13, 14. And let me read it from here. This is what, this is what uh, it's in the message. It says, but make sure you don't get so absorbed and exhausted in taking care of all your day-to-day -day obligations that you lose track of the time and doze off, oblivious to God. Hmm. The night is about over and dawn is about to break. Be up and awake to what God's doing. God is putting the finishing touches on the salvation work he began when we first believed. We can't afford to waste a minute. Must not squander these precious daylight hours in frivolity and indulgence, in sleeping around, in dissipation, in bickering and grabbing everything in sight. Get out of bed and get dressed. Don't loiter and linger, waiting until the very last minute. Dress yourselves in Christ. Be up and about. Isn't that good? Yeah, that's pretty cool. He's encouraging us here. It's time for us to be so captivated in Christ that our changed life is changing other lives. You can bring hope. You can bring peace. People are reading you. They may not be reading the Bible, but they're reading you. What are they catching? If you remember at the beginning, I said it's caught, not taught. What do they catch when they see you live your life? You know, that year that my husband um, was so sick, his last year here, uh, we had to move in with my parents. We lived very remote up in the mountains, and so it was too far from any hospitals. And so I needed help with the children because they were so young. And so I asked Mom and Dad, I said, do you mind if we come and live with you? And they were gracious and welcoming, and uh, our little family took over their retirement home. <laughs> and... Uh, and it was really amazing how we not only took over their home, we took over their lives and the lives in their neighborhood. And it was not unusual to see just a stream of neighbors coming by. They'd bring food. They'd just hang out. People from the church would come. And in fact, one day I, was, I had a good friend she was actually my counselor back in the day. 
And she said, Linda, what can we do for you? And I said, I was just joking. I said, well, you could get sleep for me. I sure do need it. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting because it was about a week later, she had put together a whole team of people coming two by two. And they would come at 11 o'clock at night with full instructions that I was not to be talked to. If they talked to me, they told me how they, I had to go to bed. And they would sit up with Bill all through the night because that was his worst time during the cancer. It's something about darkness. Sometimes it's hard to sleep at night because your thoughts are racing and your mind's not disciplined and it just gets hard. And we had these steady stream of people would come in, they would two by two, they would come in at night, 11 o'clock, and leave at six o'clock in the morning when I got up to take the kids and get them ready for school. And they did that probably his last two months of life. It was amazing to see the love that came in through those doors. And what actually happened in our whole neighborhood, which was just a neighborhood, guys. It wasn't an extension of Beach Church or anything like that. Was that so many people would just be outside and they would be praying with somebody leaving or coming. It just got to be like a holy, a holy place. Um, a whole group of ladies came. They just moved their prayer group that they usually had. They moved it to me so that I could look forward to that. Uh, one morning a week. It was just amazing to see the body of Christ in action. It wasn't that they said or really did anything spectacular. They just were the body of Christ. You see? What's God calling you to in the body? How is he going to take your sight and make it bigger? To see beyond your struggles, see beyond your circumstances, stretch you to a place where you can see Jesus everywhere you go. You know he's there, right? He's looking for you to look up to look up out of your busy world, out of your uh, overscheduled uh, calendar. He is looking for you. He always is. And I want to encourage you, you to really spend some time in this sheet. It's uh, blue. <laughs> blue. And it's put off, put on. He's going to show you where um, if you struggle with rebellion, if you look right across, he's going to show you where to go in scripture for submission. If you're discontent, he's going to show you how to get contentment. That's how this works. It's going to, you're going to willingly take off what doesn't belong in you. Like I told you, I wish I could hook you up to a machine and we could do this quick. <laughs> I'd like that for losing weight too. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. <laughs> it takes work. Okay, and that's what this is. It's thought by thought by thought. Taking the wrong captive and replacing it with the good. This is a valuable, valuable sheet, guys. The work is done for you. That's the fun thing about salt. It takes these principles that maybe you've heard about for a long time, and now we're going to give you the tools. If you struggle with anger, I don't know where it is on here. I'm sure it's, where is it? Twelve, Twelve. impatience. Um, that's going to show you. Or, uh, irritation to others, 17. Uh, where are you? Okay, the numbers are sort of, where is it? <laughs> You know what? I'm not going to worry about it because you're going to do it. <laughs> but you get, you get the point. And the last thing uh, I want to go over right now before we close out um, is that you always have a choice. 
each day, um, each day you get to choose love, you get to choose joy, you get to choose peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to talk a lot more about this in the days to come and in the lessons ahead. But my challenge for you is peace. Now let me tell you why that's so important. Because that's a missing element. It's a missing P-I-E-C-E in our world today. We are missing this peace in our lives. And what it is, it's really P-E-A-C-E. -E. It's the peace of God. When you get better at taking thoughts captive, you should be able, no matter what happens, in probably 15 to 30 seconds, be able to recalibrate and find peace, no matter what happens. I hope somebody here is challenged by that. That's how important it is for us to be known as someone who brings peace to a situation. There's nothing peaceful about the world we live in, guys. But if you bring just peace to a situation, you've already brought the incredible presence of the Holy Spirit. And you can be working on this right now. Whatever's churning up your mind, wherever your worry goes, wherever your rabbit trails are that, that your mind takes, and I know I, I used to do this a lot, I still can get undone at times. But I'm saying after a while you develop this and you go right away to work in it, peace. My sheep hear my voice. Okay, Lord, I know I'm your child. You're working in ways I can't see. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. Thank you, Father, you never leave me, you never turn your back on me. This is what is needed in your mind, in my mind, is to cultivate this place, this very center, in the center of our being is peace that passes all understanding in the midst of whatever you're going through. I can't give it to you, but I can show you how to get there. Okay? You have to do the work. You have to do it. That's what this little sheet is going to help you see. Embrace it. Um, I encourage each one of you to uh, join us in this, in this journey. I believe you're here because you want to. You may just be starting out in this. Um, walking out after the Spirit means you're following in Christ. But Satan wants your mind. He wants you to think like this world. <laughs>